This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Welcome to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening. My guest today is Jay Richards, and we're going to talk about his book, Eat, Fast, and Feast, Heal Your Body While Feeding Your Soul, A Christian Guide to Fasting. And he talks about why modern science and ancient Christian traditions support fasting for healthy living. So we're going to talk about, obviously, fasting, prayer, the ketogenic diet, ketosis. We're going to talk about disease and food, cancer, diabetes. We're going to talk a little bit about subsidies and probably even talk a little bit about hylomorphism. That is, what does it mean to be an embodied person, right? And this, is, I think, is an interesting question because, as you've probably heard me talk about before, I think we tend to make an error. We either are materialists or spiritualists. But in fact, human beings are embodied persons. And so how we eat, how we live with our body, the, what we do in our body and our biology has effects on, on our spirit. But just because we're embodied and biological doesn't mean we're simply matter. And the reaction to materialism isn't spiritualism, but I think a proper understanding of the human person. And so Jay deals with all of these questions, but mostly through the questions of eating and fasting and the importance of feasting. So we're going to talk about all those things. So thank you for listening. Thanks for all those who've written reviews. It really helps grow the podcast. I appreciate it. As always, I'm going to have notes and links to Jay's book and other things we discuss at themoralimagination.com. Thanks again to those who supported on Patreon. You can find a link to the Patreon at themoralimagination.com. So I hope you enjoy my podcast with Jay Richards on Eat, Fast, and Feast. So Jay, really delighted to have you uh, back on The Moral Imagination. You're now third time. Uh, and we're, I'm, <laughs> so thanks for joining. It's great to be with you, Michael. Thanks uh, for talking. It's great to talk about this during Lent, obviously. Right. So this is a perfect time. Lent is a, a good time to talk about fasting. And so, um, first of all, I just love your book. It was great. It was so good. I actually pre-ordered the copy. So I have a confession to make. I pre-ordered it and I sent you a text when I got it. And this pre-order yeah. came in and I read it last week. Okay. So it took me a long time, but it was on the front of my shelf. <laughs> but I it's a it nice a cover. Yeah. It's a great cover. Yeah, I liked it. It was pretty on the bookshelf. So yeah. no, but I, I liked it. I mean, I liked it for a couple reasons. One, I think it's excellent. I want to go through it and talk about I think it was unique, and I want you to comment on that what mm-hmm. what you did, because I think you brought in there's very few things like it that I've read. Now, as you know, mm-hmm. you and I have been talking about food for over a decade. I've been reading more on than food. that. <laughs> More than that. And and I remember so years ago, our friend Jonathan Witt used to tease my wife that she should write a cookbook called The Butter Diet <laughs> because we were pro-fat and you were anti-fat. That's and right. It's so funny reading parts of it, like laughing. Like I remember that. You're like, you describe your the things you were eating. And everything. It's just so fun. So anyway, I love the book. It was great. And I read parts of it to my wife and she said, hey, Jay wrote The Butter Diet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Somebody had to do it. No, she, you did it. She's too busy with her, you know, raising a bunch of kids right now, so I figure somebody's <laughs> going to write it. <laughs> so no, it's really it's really good. And you know, these questions of fat and protein and how to think about these things, and yep. you know, should you rinse out your cottage cheese to make sure you know, all these things? That, <laughs> anyway, great great book. So let's let's actually um, let's talk about it a little bit. Why don't you give the the big picture of the book? Yeah. What prompted you? to write it and why you think it's different. And then we'll go into some of the key things you talk about. Well, the book is one of the few that I wrote because I had a personal epiphany. As you describe it, actually, I sort of changed my mind about the way we should eat. But I was also, I should say, as a Christian, never a great faster. And part of the reason, a large part of the reason I was a not a great faster, is that I had bought into a particular nutritional orthodoxy that said actually to be healthy, to retain lean muscle mass and to, to you know keep fat off your body, keep your blood sugar level, you need to eat lots of small meals throughout the day really, really frequently. And that's by far the best thing to do. And I, this is so bad. My daughters remind me that I used to make them eat right when they get up and make them eat protein and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And yet it's really not true. If you actually look at the details, the, the idea that we're supposed to eat, you know, so basically 18 hours a day, as long as whenever we're awake, there's actually no good evidence for that. There's also no good evidence that fat properly construed is bad for you or that fat is the reason that we're fat. Um, in fact, there's lots of evidence to the contrary. So with all these kind of intellectual orthodoxies that have prevented me from fasting. I didn't didn't really realize at the time, but I had to have a medical procedure done a few years ago, and I had to fast for 36 hours. And I had happened, I was sort of dabbling in the low-carb diet at the time, so I was eating low-carb, you know, and I thought this was going to be terrible, this is going to be a disaster. 
I'm uh, my my audio book just went off. Did you hear that? I did, but that's okay. We'll just we'll just either we're gonna leave it in here as just like raw. Uh, yes, raw. exactly. <laughs> and uh, so, so I went 36 hours on a fast, and right at the end, I did a workout, and I felt really good. I felt lucid. My mind was clear. I was actually more energetic than I normally was, and I did what any modern man would do is I went to Google to find out what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> turns, go. Duck, duck, go. Yeah, I know, but this was, I was still doing Google. And yeah. it turns out this is an, an effect. This is a, a metabolic effect. If your body kicks into this really metabolic pathway called uh, ketosis, in which your body is essentially converting fats into these things called ketones for fuel, rather than converting the sugars that we constantly eat into glucose. Your body, it turns out, has these two metabolisms, sort of. It's, it, we're like hybrids. And one of the effects of this state of ketosis is this kind of mental clarity for a lot of people. And I experienced that. And that got me on, you know, down the rabbit hole, reading about the ketogenic diets and paleo diets and fasting, which it turns out had at the time had gone from totally crazy to kind of California fringe. A guy, Jason Fung, who's a physician, had written a mm -hmm. book on fasting. And this is kind of the new thing that, in fact, people are now fasting, at least at the time in California, for their physical health, totally contrary to what I'd actually thought. And so I spent about a year on this and really kind of underwent an intellectual conversion. I already knew the story about fat. I did not realize the health and physical benefits of fasting. And then that made me realize, ultimately, you know, it's funny because, of course, this is a, a traditional Christian practice that we've mostly completely dropped, except for this little tiny fake fast that we do on Ash Wednesdays. Um, and, but it was that kind of connection that, well, it turns out maybe God wants us to fast, and it's good for us physically and spiritually, if we do it the right way. So the, the purpose of the book, that's a long way of saying the purpose of the book is to bring all of that stuff together. The recent data about the benefits of fasting with the traditional Christian wisdom, not only fasting in general, but of a robust fasting schedule that lasts throughout the year. Well, yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, I think a couple of things that struck me. One is I, I really like how you connect it to the Christian liturgical tradition. Mm -hmm. And in the Orthodox, right, in the Eastern Catholic and in the Orthodox, right, there's great Lent, yes. but there's also the fasting in Advent. There's a fasting before mm -hmm. the Assumption, right? Yep. Or that they call it the Dormition in, in, right. in Orthodoxy. There's different fasts. There's Wednesday, Friday fasts. And these That's have been right. in tradition for 2,000 years. And if you take the Jewish tradition, right, fasting <laughs> has been a tradition of our tradition in the Christian tradition for 5,000, like almost 6,000 yeah. years. And, and so it's well. interesting, I thought, how you brought that together. The other thing, well, I want to talk about some of the like the connection to the liturgical year. But mm -hmm. one of the things I think was was really good that's helpful is you make this point early on and throughout the book that because we eat the standard American diet, right, which is high carb, and then mm -hmm. the post kind of Ansel Keys cholesterol craze, you have this yes. idea of, you know, that you should eat non-fat, low, low fat blueberry muffins, you know, mm -hmm. instead of eggs and meat, that <laughs> it actually made us fat. Right, like um, yep. Joel Salatin says, that's how you feed a cow. You you get him fat right. by feeding him grains. You, you fatten but them it, up it, right at the end. Right, exactly. And, but it also created this metabolic problem that's that right. not only has effect on cancer and diabetes. We'll talk about. But I thought this was great. Is that it makes it really, really hard to fast. And you that's make right. this point where you say, so God calls us to fast right? Mm -hmm. And to be humble yes. and to restrain our tongue, right? From <laughs> evil speaking. Imagine if every time you had to restrain your tongue, you got an intense migraine, yeah. right? You make this point, like fasting's hard, but it's not supposed to be agony or beating you up. It's and that torture. part of the reason is our diets are so bad, it's hard to fast. That's so great. And I think also so encouraging to people who've tried to fast for a day and they're like, I can't do this anymore. Can oh, you explain no. that a little bit? Absolutely. I say fasting is meant to be a sacrifice. It's not meant to be torture. If you have, to, yeah, I said, if you get up, have to get up early in the morning and you're praying, yeah, you're sleeping. You don't want to wake up. So that's a sacrifice. But yeah, if, if you literally made you sick, that would be a sign that, okay, we're doing something wrong here. And the reality is, I mean, I'll say really simply, the kind of key insight is I think God designed us to be metabolically flexible. If you think about how humans live for most of our existence, we didn't have wheat thins whenever we wanted, right? We didn't have our protein shakes and our granola bars right before we went to bed. That's not how we existed. And so it makes sense that God would 
create us for the kind of normal human existence where you might have a lot of food part of the year or part of the time, and then you need to go some time without eating. And so what that means is that under those normal circumstances, right, where you'd have lean times and you'd have sort of times of feast, your body's going to be really good at using sugar if you happen to have fruit during the summer, probably, but also really good at using fat for fuel and using animal protein for fuel, different kinds of things. And so under the normal pressures of human existence until the 20th century, people were metabolically flexible. We could use fat, we could use sugar. But the combination of constant abundance of food in which we're eating constantly, and then this intellectual orthodoxy where fat's bad, carbs good, and then a massive in some ways, an amazing miracle where we are able to process food to last for a long time. What that does is it basically has trained our bodies just to use carbohydrates and to use simple carbohydrates. And what that means is that we're on this constant metabolic cycle where we're spiking our blood sugar, we wait a couple hours, it drops again, and we need to boost it again every couple hours to do that. Whereas if you're in ketosis, that is, if your body switches over into that other metabolic pathway and it's burning fat for ketones, your blood sugar just stays basically the same. It stays fairly low, but it stays the same and you do not feel that. And so when Jesus was fasting for 40 days, it was it was hard. He had to do it, you know, in his human capacity. But people that are fasting for days at a time are entirely in ketosis. They're not experiencing that sugar spike that you get three hours after you have your latte. And so this thing that everybody has in their minds, oh, I can't fast. Oh, no, I have a bl- everybody thinks they have a blood sugar problem. No, you don't. You, you just, you've been living on sugar for 40 years. It's not that hard as long as you know how to transition into it. And that's what I do in the book is I create a six-week transition plan, basically, where you first you get your body used to using fat for fuel, then you slowly narrow the window of time in which you eat, so-called intermittent fasting, right? So eat all that you normally do, but do it in eight hours during the day rather than 12, and then do it in four hours. And so you work your way down. And you. so what you're really doing is you're training your habits and your metabolism in order to be able to be a real faster. So that it's still, you know, I'm fasting right now. I'm hungry. But if I'd been trying to do this five years ago at you know, 11 in the morning or, you know, and I haven't eaten breakfast, I'd be dying, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no, me too. Yeah, so I actually really like that part. So we're using it right now. My wife and I are using it's it great. and it's great. And I, um, and it's like, you can imagine in our house, we have debates like, I don't know if Jay's right about that. Remember the time he didn't eat his cake on his 40th birthday? I said, yes, but I had to, I had to defend you once. No, anyway, we laugh about, we were having so much fun reading your book and it's so good, but I really like, that's super helpful to listeners. If you, I mean, I'm really, I am promoting this book because if you are figuring out how do I fast, I mean, the way you work it through Jay, where you, where you start in your first week, just cutting out the carbs, yeah. it makes it so much easier than to go into intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. You know, and now maybe, you know, it's a Ash Wednesday, you, which we passed, but you just start with nothing and then you go into ketosis maybe a little bit faster. But I think, that's right. I really think that's good. So let, let's talk about a couple things, but I, I think that's excellent how you do that. So let me, I just want to make sure. So the metabolically flexible point is that our bodies are designed in a way that we can either operate off of a, in a of ketosis mm-hmm. or with constant sugar. And that's, that's right. what you mean by flexible. And so that it'll work both ways. But one mm-hmm. of them is a lot healthier for us. And the other one, while it works, has a lot of negative consequences. That's right. And so I, I wouldn't go so far as I, my advice isn't that everyone should always eat a ketogenic diet. It's that right. if you have never done that, you have to do it in order to train yourself so that you can later be metabolically flexible. Now, the thing is, is that now if you're really healthy, your body will be using some fat for fuel and using sugar for fuel, but it, there is a bit of a switch. You tend to be doing one or the other. And so your body will tend to prefer to use sugar for fuel just because it's actually really kind of an easy metabolic process. And so that's why it, it takes work to get your fat metabolism up and running so that it uses ketosis. But the thing is, is if you fast regularly, right? So like it's part of your week, actually your kind of daily schedule, part of your weekly schedule. And then you have the liturgical seasons where you're really fasting like they used to, not the kind of fake little fasts. You will be metabolically flexible. You will be sampling both of these metabolic pathways and you'll be experiencing fasting as most people who've really fasted have experienced it. And so that you have it, it is a blessing. It's a sacrifice, but it's also a blessing. So there are real consolations to it. 
as opposed to, okay, well, darn, now it's time for me to just beat myself, you know, over the, yeah. which is what we've kind of imagined in the 20th century. Wow. Fasting is so hardcore. I can never do it. Well, if God wants us to do this, you know, it seems unlikely that he's telling us to literally torture ourselves. Sacrifice and restraint is not the same as torture. Right. And I think two things I liked about this one is that what you're doing in this book, one of the things I think that makes it unique, correct me if I misread it, but that, mm-hmm. so I've read a lot of books on food, as you know, and been reading it. Yeah. And, and uh, one day I, my wife had been on a trip visiting family. I came, she came back and I had read the China study. Mm-hmm. So I did a vegan diet for six weeks. She's like, yeah. what happened to you? I was like, <laughs> you know, she's like, my husband is always- <laughs> It's like, I, yeah, can't eat, like, I can't eat animals. <laughs> but, so I did it for a while. But I always, I think I've talked about this before with Diana Rogers, a podcast where people, and I was, it's a, you can't eat meat, but you really need B12. And so just take a supplement. Like, why don't you just eat steak? Like, <laughs> you know, but, but anyway, so I've tried a lot of things, but I th- one of the things I like about your book is that it's not simply a vision of, how to eat, which it is, Mm -hmm. but that it's a vision of, in a sense, how to live a fasting, feasting lifestyle. That's right. Throughout the year and throughout your life so that you're not thinking, okay, I got to be on a ketogenic diet. You know, if you're healthy, I mean, I I have to be on a ketogenic diet for the next, you know, 30 years and I just never have a cookie again. Right. It's no, it's, there's, there's ways, there's times and there's seasons. And, and you say, which I really like eat moderately most of the time. Mm-hmm. fast some of the time and feast occasionally. That's right. That's my formula. If there's a formula, and I, th- I don't think it's my formula, it's just the way I put it. That's why the book's called Eat Fast Feast, is that in the Christian tradition, and actually every religious tradition also has feasting, but we don't know what a feast is. I would argue we don't actually even quite know what a feast is if we don't have fasts, because mm-hmm. if you eat all that you basically want and can every single day, A feast is sort of like, well, okay, you maybe you're recognizing a great saint or something, but in terms of the kind of physical, the the food part of it, well, you just try to eat a little more, I guess, right? That's a totally different thing than if Mm -hmm. if, if most people think of a thousand years ago, if you're going to have a Christian feast, you're living slightly above subsistence. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to probably have to restrain and restrict what you eat part of the time in order to have more on the feast day. And your body responds to that entirely differently. If you have a constant infusion of food at the same level all the time, that is an entirely different metabolic process than if you fast part of the time and then you feast part of the time. And that's what we very often people think, well, is fasting, is this a diet? Well, no, most diets are constant calorie restriction, which I think actually is the bad idea. It messes messes up your metabolism. Fasting and feasting is an entirely different thing. And so it's just, to me, it's not a coincidence. It's like really... It shouldn't be surprising that this turns out to be beneficial for us both physically and spiritually. Yeah. And I think that goes to which we'll talk about that, what it means to be an embodied person. And that mm-hmm. I think something like you people, I think my brother in law was talking about your book and said how he was struck by the fact that, you know, in Lent, you say, okay, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to fast and lose weight. And, mm-hmm. and you almost feel a little guilty because, yeah. you know, you're really fasting. So you, so you lose, to lose fat, weight. Right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you have to order the fast to exactly. We, and let's talk about fasting in a minute. But but it's actually okay that you're losing weight. It's okay that you're becoming metabolically flexible because you're not simply an angel who happens to be driving around in your body like a car. That's you right. are an embodied person, and that's that's the beauty of it. The other thing is, you say here, you know that a lot of times diets, and I know this, right? That it doesn't put food in its proper place. Yeah, food has a place that should be. In the Jewish and the Christian traditions, you give thanks to God for food. You bless the food. You give mm-hmm. thanks to the king of the universe who provides abundance for you. Right. And, and that food is something to be grateful for. And yet gluttony is one of the seven deadly sins. And so exactly. I like how you're, you know, it's an Aristotelian mean of just. Absolutely. This helps you see food properly, properly. so that you can move on to bigger things in your life. That's exactly right. And not only that, but food. God wants us in our spiritual lives. That, that's the amazing thing about fasting is that 
It's our bodies. It's our metabolisms, right? That we order our metabolisms to spiritual things in the liturgical calendar if we, if we fast. And that's, you know, I mean, it's such an amazing reflection. It's just like, you know, there's always the temptation to totally spiritualize prayer where it's entirely mental. And if, you know, as you know, I'm a lay Dominican and St. Dominic had these like nine different body postures for different kinds of prayer, which seems sort of exotic, but it's like, okay, he was recognizing that actually you're body has something to do with prayer. And there's kind of really no more concrete way to exhibit that, I think, than fasting. You know, it makes the, the book odd. And some people thought, oh, I can't believe you're talking about all this physical stuff in a spiritual book that's about the spirit of fasting. It's like, well, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's the point. That's exactly what, what I'm trying to do. Yeah. You know, there's a book called, I think it's called Earthen Vessels by mm-hmm. Bunghe, B-U-N-G-E. I forget his first name right now. He I think he's Orthodox, but he was, he was a Benedictine in Switzerland. Yep. And, and he goes through, I think, like Evagrius Pontus and other, on prayer, on like where you mm-hmm. sit. And so we tend to think of this as an Eastern practice. Right. I lived in Japan for five years, as you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in Zen, you sit in certain ways. But in the Western Christian tradition, you have a posture yeah. of prayer. Same with, same with Judaism. You have a posture right. of prayer because we're embodied. And um, I'm actually, I think I'm going to do a podcast on prayer and meditation with um, Matt Leonard, who's Oh, that'd be great. And talk about what is meditation and mental prayer in, in the Christian mm-hmm. tradition, because that's, I think, lost as well. So let's probably, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back there to fasting, but let's go through a little bit of the, the food element. So yes. one of the things, you have this line, I got a kick out of it. I have a note here on page three. You said, I lived and preached this false gospel for years. And I wrote, yes, you did. With a smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of low fat, uh, you know, high complex carb. Yeah, eat frequently. I, it's just funny. I mean, like, as I said, I mean, it's fun. it was fun to read, read this book to, just because I know you and, and so much. But let's talk about fat. You know, um, what's your last name? Teichholz. Nina Teichholz wrote a book. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, and uh, called A Big Fat Surprise. And then, of course, Gary Taubes had yes. been working on this for a long time. And Absolutely. Weston Price. And this is actually where I started to learn these things through the Weston Price Foundation. And yep. do you follow Weston Price at all? I do. And you're the first person I ever heard mention Weston Price, I think. And I so I do follow it as a result of it. In fact, I had gotten into the studying fat and sugar and all this stuff. That was part of what prepared me for this fasting stuff is that I had already gotten over the kind of false idea that, you know, fat, fat uh, makes was, you fat. Fat's, fat makes you fat. Yeah. 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 So Weston, and I remember like he did, and I, I'm not, you probably know more about him now than I do, but he was a dentist and he did studies and he found that certain people had very low levels of cardiac disease, cancer, yep. other metabolic problems, diabetes. They also had very healthy teeth, wide jaws. Healthy teeth. They didn't have lower back problems. It's a bunch of, basically all the things that, you know, all the diseases and, and maladies of civilization, he found. And now when I, I first heard this, I thought, well, that's because they all died at 30. But no, that's actually not why. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it's kind of the error that we've talked about before. This is an economics, story. like the error of like, the life expectancy was 25. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean everybody died at no. 25. It means that there is high infant mortality. Some exactly. people live till 80 and 90, 70, exactly. 80 to those who are strong, right? And a lot and of the home. people, that's the thing in these traditional cultures. Yeah, so they have lots of death at childbirth. And so that's going to mess up the average life expectancy, obviously. But they also had a, a shortened mortality curve. So in other words, yeah, they die, but they tend to be healthy for a lot longer period in their lives. And then right toward the end, they die. Whereas we've gotten really good at prolonging life for 20 or 30 years Mm. with physical problems. But many of those physical problems, it looks like might actually be the result of our diet and lifestyle, ironically. And so you're like, we assume they're normal part of aging, but it could be the case that they're not a normal part of aging. They're not. And so Weston Price, he did this study and he found that there was a kind of a common thread, even though there's people like from Switzerland to Papua New Guinea. Sure that they did not eat processed foods right. and they actually ate like the Swiss milk, fat, cheese, yeah. eggs, meat. And they just didn't have all these things that were, as you said, the kind of orthodoxy of the time that you couldn't touch if you wanted to live. So uh, the other thing that just, by the way, just come, came up to me. So there's a doctor I've seen a little bit. He talks about sprinting and, and visceral fat. His name's Sean O'Mara. I don't know if you're following mm-hmm. him. And he ended up, he and his colleague, started doing MRIs. They were doing MRIs on people's back. And I guess the colleague set the MRI reading at the, at the wrong level, okay. but ended up getting more data and found out that all these people who had back problems also had high levels of visceral fat. 
around mm. their back and their spine. And so, and yeah. that, which is connects to your point about, I didn't, I didn't realize the Weston price point about the back. So let's talk about fat then. There was a sense that fat makes you fat, that fat's bad for you. Mm-hmm. Some of this, as I've mentioned, came from Ansel Key's study on cholesterol, and it turns Definitely. out that he falsified or at least misrepresented some of his data. It's, I'd say the best you could say is the extreme cherry picking of the data in order to confirm the hypothesis. <laughs> I, I always do that. Okay, uh, so maybe could you walk us through that? Let's. How do we think about fat? This is going to be a shock to people. Yeah, we basically think that we connect fat and cholesterol. We assume uh, because, of course, we often, when people get their arteries clogged, I'm speaking in the vernacular here, and we find cholesterol, that it's fat and cholesterol that causes this. This is where we've sort of gotten that panic. A lot of this is really just an artifact of what we were able to measure. So we were able to measure total cholesterol before we were able to spread these things out. Most people now know there's a so-called good and a healthy and an unhealthy cholesterol, the LDL and the HDL. It's a sort of complicated story that would honestly take 20 minutes, I think, to describe sort of justifiably. But I think that the, the kind of key lesson is that the probably the likely culprit of so many of our health problems, whether you're talking about um, <laughs> you know clogged arteries or hardened arteries or type 2 diabetes or obesity, is not fat. It's just not fat. It is a highly processed simple carbohydrates that we eat continually and that is essentially a a metabolic problem and that natural fat is generally good for us as long as we're eating it properly. Now, if you're eating a standard American diet and Oreos and highly refined foods, then what your body does with the fat is going to be different than what it does if you're not doing that. If you're generally eating whole foods, if you're not constantly eating processed foods, if you're fasting and so you're tapping into your your metabolic flexibility, what happens metabolically is just entirely different. And fat is your friend, uh, which really makes sense. Fat is, first of all, fatty foods tend to be nutritionally dense. They're obviously calorically dense. And so this idea that, you know, if you look at the animal kingdom and notice that what animals do, what a tiger does when they kill a gazelle is they go right for the fat and the visceral organs, and then they'll eat the meat, the muscle last. The idea that, oh, no, that's precisely what we shouldn't be eating it seems sort of counterintuitive, and it turns out I think that's exactly right. And so this this weird detour in mostly American uh, nutrition in which fat is treated as the uh, nutritional enemy, I think it's coming to an end. But this, of course, it does tie in to this whole question of fasting because part of what makes the fasting lifestyle possible is training your body to be able to use fat for fuel, not just dietary fat, actually, but also the, the fat that you carry around on your body. Yeah. So you talked about processed foods. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the problem of sugar. Yeah. And these processed foods and, and maybe explain that by sugar, you don't just mean, you know, cane sugar. Table sugar. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. And that's what people often don't understand. They say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I've, I've cut out sugar for Lent. And yet, of course, Table sugar or sucrose is is one form of sugar, but the reality is actually when you eat bread, you know, lots of things you eat when you eat fruit, of course, bread actually converts to sugar very, very quickly. And so basically any carbohydrate is basically part of your sugar metabolism. I don't want people to think that sugar in that sense is somehow an enemy. My point is that if you're just tapping into that mm-hmm. form of the sugar metabolism, and moreover, that you're the sources of carbohydrate and sugar that you're getting are highly refined, that what you're you're doing is you're essentially setting yourself up for something called insulin resistance because your body uses this hormone of insulin in order to basically control blood sugar within a very narrow window. And if you're constantly spiking your blood sugar, then your pancreas is having to release insulin to get the blood sugar down. And as with anything, you know, just like if you're taking morphine all the time, your body will build up a resistance to it. Uh, If you're constantly spiking your blood sugar with simple sugars and refined foods, your cells actually become resistant to insulin. And so you end up with very, very high levels of insulin in your system and your body, basically training your body because then what what does it do with fat? Well, what it does is it stores fat. And so all ex- all the extra sugars get stored for fat, and then it, and then your body doesn't actually know how to use the fat for fuel because it's still on this kind of – it's still in this sugar – essentially sugar insulin cycle. And so that's the, that's the sort of weird thing is that we actually have been training our bodies not to be – both to store fat 
but not to be able to use it for fuel. And so it shouldn't, it just really shouldn't be a mystery why so many of us are fat and obese. It's, a, it's not all that complicated. Yeah. So Gary, I think it's Gary Taubes, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. He says, you know, it's not exercise. It's not, I mean, obviously exercise matters. He's saying, sure. and we'll talk about it because you actually write about exercise in the book a little bit. Yeah. But it's that really we're eating the standard American diet, which is basically you know, that food pyramid that everybody saw there. Mm-hmm. When they were, it's still in books, you know. So like it's my still, absolutely still. And I've still, I've got it memorized. It's burned into my, I've got the neuronal pathways. You got all the pasta and the bread and the stuff down at the bottom, right? Yeah. Yeah. Eat all that as much as you can. That's good for you. Yeah. Then, That's right. And then you get some, you get some fruit and some stuff like that. And then you get lean meat and sort of lean sources of protein. And then you get sweets and oils, the fat, basically. And so everybody, the nice thing is everybody sort of, no one's ever gotten around to the idea that just eating lots of sweets is good for you. So at least everybody's sort of agrees. (laughs) That's the one part, right? The Venn diagram, yeah. Exactly, where the most diets actually overlap. But then you get the fats and the oils way up at the top. So just sparingly. So basically, Pasta is your friend, you know, and fat is your enemy. Yeah. That's that's and it's not, and that's the thing. It's, it's a, and it's disheartening to people. I mean, this is another thing. One, you think you're dieting, yes, and you're working really hard, and you're being tortured, yes, because you feel so terrible. That's right, and you stay fat, or you even get fatter. That's and you right. Think like it's so discouraging. Whereas if you if you reverse that and you you build and you actually, I like how you did a pyramid here. You did. Yeah, this, here's the, a pyramid. If yeah, you want a that's pyramid. Fun. <laughs> yeah, if you want a pyramid, here's a better pyramid where you have good, healthy fats on the bottom. And and it's important to say, like, not all oils are healthy. You no, want to avoid no, not at all. In fact, just, really just stuff that eat fats. If you're wondering, when people say, well, what fat should I eat? Well, did nature make the fat? Then it's probably okay. And it's it's a normal fat that's for consumption, right? So I'm not talking about hydrocarbons. But, you know, basically any, any sort of normal animal or plant fat that is normal. Right, that doesn't require a really complicated process to produce. Right, olive so oil. It's, Coconut yeah, olive oil, oil olives are fatty. Yeah, butter. It's just really kind of commonsensical. Now, something might seem like it came from a plant, but like, okay, corn oil. Does corn seem like an oily thing to you? You know, or cotton? See, it doesn't. I don't think of that. Well, it turns out that's hard. It takes a complicated industrial process in order to produce fat from those sources. And the reason, the only reason we really produce fat from those sources is because of weird subsidies having to do in that case with corn. It makes it really cheap. And so it's a sort of a byproduct. Now, I'm not saying that anytime technology is involved, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. My point is, is that if you're saying, okay, if something's good for human consumption, am I going to go with this thing that is like a recent addition that we're producing really only because of a weird theory about natural fats being bad for you? And that requires this complex chemical process to produce and that no one's ever really ever eaten for nutrition before. Am I going to eat that or am I going to eat something that humans have been living off of for thousands of years? You know, like if that's your only information, right. well, I think I'm going to go with the thing that's been time tested in that case. And I'll, I'll sit kind of loosely on the wisdom of eating that, that sort of weird thing. Right. Well, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really important. And, and there's, there's actually a couple of things I want to talk to you about in what you just said. So we can break that out. But one is, you know, this podcast is called The Moral Imagination, which, as you know, mm-hmm. comes line from Burke, where he says mm-hmm. the word of moral imagination has been emptied. And it's a critique of hyper-rationalism of the economists, sophists, and calculators, right? Yes. And he's not saying that you shouldn't calculate. He's saying of that, course. you know, this idea that the tradition doesn't matter mm-hmm. and that we can just kind of technically, rationally create things. So it's really, yeah. it's like food, sometimes I think, People may say, why does like Michael do food and farming on the moral imagination? But it's actually an, a really important element because it takes trial and error and democracy of the dead tradition yes. seriously. And so, you know, people like Nassim Taleb are really good on this. Like, yeah. what's going to last longer? You know, the pencil or, or this? He's like, well, the pencil, because it's lasted so long. It, we know that things that have worked over time are good. And so butter... Like, if you think about it this way, and correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. butter was, everybody thought butter was fine until like the mm-hmm. 1950s or 60s, Ansel Keys, and then uh, I think President Eisenhower had a heart attack. He was worried about butter. It became like, right. don't eat butter. And everybody moved to these like partially hydrogenated industrial processed things like that. Totally. And I mean, I took maybe jump, you're a philosopher, a theologian, yes. you know, 
I mean, jump, help me at this or critique it. Like, it seems like this is actually partially what the problem with hyper-rationalism. I just did a podcast Absolutely. with your friend, George Gilder, who critiques materialist superstitions of technology. And I say, you know, one of the errors we've made, we've identified digital technology with its, with like one articulation of the Google Burning Man vision. Oh yeah, that's bad. But it's yeah. broader than that. And so too, we've kind of parallel, like in the moral imagination, if you don't buy into a hyper-rationalistic, kind of technocratic, scientistic way of seeing the world, yeah. you don't tend to make the mistake that like you shouldn't eat butter, you should eat some factory-made thing. No, but yeah, you know, that's because it really, once you see it, it seems obvious that, okay, look, even if you're kind of, even if you sort of think of these ways in, in a Darwinian way, I mean, and I think natural selection is a real thing, but the reality is if something's a poison, Humans aren't going to be eating poisonous stuff that kills them right away for thousands of years, right? Because they're just going to get weeded out of the gene pool. Um, and so what that means is that, okay, that doesn't mean that a brand new kind of fancy thing that you create to substitute for this traditional thing is necessarily deadly, right? but it hasn't been tested. That's my point. It's, I, it's, not, yeah. I mean, it's not a Luddite point. It's like it hasn't been tested. So what? I want a really good reason why I'm going to eat this weird margarine instead of, you know, animal or natural kind of plant fat. I, I re and I want something other than Ansel Key's terrible study that falls apart on even slight inspection. And so, but that's unfortunately what happens. And part of actually the kind of hyper-rationalism of really of, of technocracy is this idea that scientific officials, all of whom always seem to work for the government or are funded for the government, have somehow, it's their job to tell us how to live our lives, how to teach our children, how to eat food, right? I mean, because all of this really was the result of big science and this idea that, yeah. well, scientific officials, right? I mean, so that food pyramid came from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's original job was basically to support American agriculture as like the government, you know, um, cheerleading. Why would they, first of all, have an interest in these kind of nutritional questions? More to the point, why should we assume that they have any wiser on it than, than anyone else? Because there are no lobbyists in Washington. No, none whatsoever. None. Nobody, nobody is like, no big corporations are saying to the government, you know, support corn syrup. No, no one's, that would never happen. That would never happen. So you should just trust them. I mean, this is what, that's what's so odd about this. And in, so in some ways, you know, what's funny is that this is not really, it's not really a partisan issue either because there are people on the left and on the right. There are, mm -hmm you know, Michael Pollan types, and there are homes, Catholic homeschool moms that both are sort of aware of this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic about it. And so this, that it's funny, but yeah, it kind of, I guess it shouldn't surprise us, but even our food choices have been in some ways corrupted by bad ideology. Yeah. I'm just like, you know, everybody says science is real and they're total empiricists. And I always say, so what's real? <laughs> Did you empirically prove that? I mean, like the, the point, it's, it's, it's embedded in something else. And I think this goes back to Taleb, you know, who he's really, I think, interesting on this is like looking yeah. at the effects over time and avoiding this kind of, I'm going to do a test. I mean, I think, you know, this is a, I mean, this is maybe a different, we could have a different discussion on this, but, you know, like Taleb is, is kind of, um, he's skeptical of GMOs and right. he's skeptical of GMOs for a number of reasons, but one of them is it's a massive civilizational test with 90% of our corn and wheat. Yeah. Not that it's like 10% trial and error. It's that right. we're making a decision when we don't have long-term impact. That's right. And I think that's a good argument for lots of things. It, it's not an argument for not doing anything. Right. It's just right. an argument for pr just proceeding, be prudential about these things. And that's, so that's what's weird about having kind of a national government policy on food is that or you science, right? Yeah, or science is that you're basically so you're imposing this. You say we're going to do this massive experiment on something that hasn't been tested. Whereas the reality is like with GMOs, right? Okay, we want to trial and error because in a sense, the GMOs are, it, we're just kind of in some ways speeding up what we, humans have done for thousands of years when we mm -hmm. cultivate. But it's sped up, and so we want to make sure there aren't these kind of unintended consequences. Same thing with vaccines, right? Let's just. Let's just be careful here and not assume that, well, something that people have been doing for thousands of years, that's really what's killing us. And this brand new thing, this is all, this is going to be fine. I mean, the reality is, is that this kind of the epidemic of obesity and type two diabetes 
these are recent problems. These are, it's not like, you know, the massive increase in obesity and type 2 diabetes has happened at a particular time in the late 20th century. Right. And so it stands to reason it's something we've done recently that's actually causing the problem. And then when you scratch the surface, turns out there's a really simple uh, dietary explanation for it. Yeah, that's good. I think that's right. And so it's like, it's a mindset too. Uh, that's why our food connects to the moral imagination to this in the Burkean sense of, mm-hmm. of taking tradition seriously and developing things. So let's, I want to go back to insulin for a minute because I think it's important, but let's, since we're here, let's just talk about technology because you said it before and, and I think it's important. You're not arguing there's no place for technology. There's no, no. place for uh, innovation. A lot of the things we know that you've learned over the last years are actually mm-hmm. from scientific studies, like high technology, like being able to do better blood work and MRIs. Yeah. And so why don't you just address a little bit about that? Because I think some people will say, you know, I guess this leads into the, even the paleo question. Some people will say, you know, modern industrial life is just bad. Mm-hmm. Well, we also see modern industrial life allowing people to have longer life expectancy and right. widespread prosperity so that you and I have the ability to have this podcast and have nice coffee from all over the world and all these other right. things because if you're fasting you got to drink coffee uh, <laughs> <You sure do. laughs> uh, but <laughs> but but so you know there's a way of thinking about that could you talk about maybe like the tensions there because i think we tend to either become you know, I've said this on the podcast before. You've probably heard me talk about it. I, I make mm-hmm. this joke of the the right and the left, and it doesn't just affect the right and left, but it's just kind of like the right says, if the left says, I, I make this joke, of where where would you go to find community? And the mm-hmm. left says, well, I go to a f- farmer's market, which is a free, abrasively free, highly unregulated market. <laughs> and then you ask like a free market conservative who takes, you know, uh, tradition seriously. What do you think about them? Oh, a bunch of hippies over there. But it's actually really interesting because it's both a free market on the purpose of subsidiarity. And I know it's way yeah. more complex than that, but I'm just sure. saying, it's re- okay, it's, there's a lot of things going on. But it's also kind of a traditional way of thinking about about food. And remember when we were in that CSA project together and like that's where uh-huh. you had to learn to love kale? Uh, <laughs> there's something Burkean about that yeah. And then the other reaction is sometimes people who are Birkin all of a sudden become technocrats. It's like, right. so I don't know, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of things at you, but- Well, you are, but I mean, think of the fact that transhumanists in California, right? right. Um, working at Google who think they're going to upload their bodies or upload themselves to the internet and get rid of their crappy old bodies, right? Are also, I bet you, shopping at Whole Foods and are really hardcore environmentalists and want to return to nature, Right, which I think what that tells you is that there's a crazy schizophrenia because they've got yep. a bad anthropology. The Christian anthropology is the right one, and it's the one that recognizes us as both spiritual and physical being. As you said, embodied persons. We are, in a sense, we are bodies, but we certainly have bodies that, and our personhood is concrete. It's incarnate, and so it stands to reason that our spiritual life would affect our self our bodies, our kind of physical existence, and what we do physically would affect us spiritually. That's what the fasting and a feasting lifestyle built into the annual calendar does, is it, is it unifies that so that you don't have to see these things as sort of a false opposition, and you avoid the really crazy stuff. On the one hand, you, you can avoid the crazy transhumanism, which really is a rejection of the body, but also this kind of, there's the, the lurch to the other side is a complete rejection of innovation and technology. I mean, ultimately, innovation and technology is the result of us being made in the image of the creative God. And so that's right. something to be embraced. But it's also not going to be our salvation. This is the problem is the transhumanists are turning our technology into a God. And so I really do think a proper Christian anthropology it prevents you from falling for one of, or the other of these extremes. And in this case, I think, as you said, it might be that the best evidence from science directs us to a more traditional food lifestyle. Right. That it's that's one pathway is that to discover that, oh, it turns out fasting and eating the foods that nature produces um, and not eating all this weird processed stuff is actually good for you. And one way we know that is from science, which is the result of obviously modern technology and modern methods. Right. Which is, by the way, the result of the fact that in the West, uh, yes. that there's this deep sense that being is good. That's right. And that the world is intelligible. 
and that we have reason that can give us an understanding of the world, even if it's not perfect, and that things are not totally random, upon which science rests, even though it's That's forgotten right. its sources. You know, I think I, just a couple of comments. One is, you know, you said pretty strongly that Christian anthropology is the right one. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, I agree with that. But I, I think it's, you know, maybe for listeners who might think like, well, that's a big statement. I mean, as you know, I give this lecture every year at, at Acton University and, and other places on like seven attributes of what it means to be, like what's Christian anthropology. And I always yeah. argue, and I know you do this and you've been doing this for decades, that we're not simply saying, you know, the Bible said so. <laughs> we're saying that the Christian articulation of what it means to be an embodied person with reason, will, mm -hmm right? Social nature, yeah. unique unrepeatability, et cetera. And, you know, work and et cetera is actually the most coherent vision that not only aligns with our lived experience, but also aligns with science as well. Exactly. And like, yes, it's complex. And, you know, there's no theory of everything. And there's, you know, I mentioned, I think you actually, but we saw, I, somebody had tweeted something about no free will. And I said, you know, mm -hmm. you're trying to solve excruciatingly complex philosophical problems with a tweet. You know, it's complex. But this idea of, of Christian anthropology and the embodied person or, or hylomorphic understanding yeah. really does, it avoids the, you know, hedonistic element of the body is all there is, which can have negative effects on the environment and yourself and mm -hmm. moral life. But it also avoids this kind of, new Manichaeanism of the transhumanists who, in a sense, are just trying to escape from the body. I mean, it's just yeah. an old, it's a new technical version of an old thing. And I think, Absolutely. and the second thing that's related is, you know, there's no technical solution to the problems of evil, sin, suffering, and death. Right. And that's another part of the, of the Christian anthropology that helps Absolutely. us think. Could you talk a little, just a little bit more, maybe just for a second, then I want to move on, just about technology and you kind of mentioned it. I mean, part of the way we think about technology is as a blessing. It's part of the yes. it's part of the gift of human beings. So can you talk about that and how to, how to factor that into this traditional diet? Yeah, because I mean, I honestly think, I mean, the fact that a billion people since 1990 have emerged from absolute poverty is a good thing and is very much dependent upon modern farming methods. I think it's a good thing that not 95% of the population has to work on farms, right? That we have become so productive in agriculture that the vast majority of us can do other things. Whereas for most of history, of course, we needed most of us working the farm. Now, that doesn't mean there's not something lost to that. Lots of us have a sense that, okay, I need a, new, a reconnection to the land. But the reality is, is that unless you actually think us living sort of hunter-gatherer lifestyles, that that would really be better and by the way, if we did that, about one one hundredth of us could, could survive, right? So you're saying 99% of your fellow human beings would be better, did not live, then you are going to have to account for this. And I think it's a perfectly natural, it's, it's intuitive, certainly as a Christian, to just to understand technology as an expression of, I mean, God commanded the first man and woman be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That that's a part of our created mandate right. prior to the fall. Prior to the fall, right. um, that's still true. But of course, the fall has happened. So that's why when we do this, we can both create amazing things that can be a blessing to ourselves and to others, but we can also really screw things up. We can uh, destroy ourselves. And sometimes with the very same technology, industrial farming techniques that make it much less expensive to farm can also end up encouraging us to have this kind of <laughs> monocrops, you know, in which we all eat one kind of thing and we eat it in the most processed form. And so, you know, it's a little bit boring, but the reality is that we just need to analyze these things carefully so that we reap the benefits and we avoid the costs insofar as we can. Yeah, that's, that's well said. So let, let's circle back a couple of things. Uh, we talked about insulin before and we talked about yeah. processed foods. So you have, there's a, you quote, Jason Fung, in his book, The Obesity Code, he says, I can make you fat. Actually, I can make anybody fat. How? By prescribing insulin. It doesn't matter if you have willpower or you exercise or what you choose to eat, you will get fat, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an interesting thing because you can prescribe insulin yes. or you can eat things that cost money. Right. So why don't you go through the insulin Absolutely. thing so that people can understand that? Absolutely. And so basically, you're 
your body has to keep blood sugar within a very narrow range in your blood. So the amount of sugar that comes in, uh, if it gets too low, actually, you can pass out, right? So you need mm-hmm. that fuel. Now, it's, it's different. You can tolerate a much lower blood sugar, actually, if you're really into ketosis. But in normal circumstances, that's not going to happen. But if sugar gets too high, it's actually toxic. You actually destroy your organs if you have too much sugar floating around in your bloodstream. And so what happens? So your body, of course, is an amazing th- system. And so what happens when you ingest carbohydrates that convert to sugar quickly or sugar directly is that it gets pushed into your bloodstream. And then what happens is that your body regulates that. So if the blood sugar gets too high, your pancreas releases this thing called insulin. And what insulin does is it basically tells the cells of your body, okay, open up and take this sugar because I need to get it out of the bloodstream. That's essentially what it does. And so it's floating around, it gets out. And so your muscle cells and your cells of your body that use sugar for fuel will, you know, under the instruction of insulin, will take in that sugar, right? And then it gets it out of your bloodstream. And your liver plays a kind of complex role in this as well. So imagine that happening, but imagine you continue doing that. Now, your cells can only hold so much sugar. And so what do they do when they've got, there's like no more room for sugar. Well, they basically think of it as put, they kind of put up defenses. Okay, no more sugar here. And insulin's tell it, you know, your body's putting more insulin out saying, come on cells, get rid of the sugar. I got to get out of the bloodstream. When that one happens, so your cells become resistant to insulin, then it ships it back to your liver, but your liver can only hold so much sugar, right? Before it's saturated. And so what does it do with the sugar? Well, it converts it to fat and it converts it to fat around your liver, uh, this is the visceral fat and your intestines. And so when you see men that have these giant beer bellies, that's not a, all that, that fat that's sticking out. It's not a bunch of fat on the surface. It's a bunch of fat under their muscles crammed around their internal organs, which if that sounds bad, good, because that's it is bad. Um, and so what's your body doing? Well, it's protecting itself from all of this blood sugar. It's converting excess sugar into fat, right? And so this is how you end up this way. And so it's an amazing system because it's in a sense, it's storing extra fat for later on the assumption that you won't have access to food. And then it will slowly convert over into ketosis and it'll use that fat. But we never do that because we continue to feed it sugar. And so this is how you can end up so-called insulin resistant. And with your body, you actually have really, really high levels of insulin. So you're walking around to keep your blood sugar level and your body is basically storing up a bunch of fat. I said, do you think of it as it's like your body at this point is like some kind of facility where you have a massive freezer down in your third basement where you store all this extra food, but you can't ever get to it to eat it. And so you're still constantly hungry. And so you're, this is what's happening. Your body's storing all this fat for fuel, which it never uses because you're on this sugar insulin. You're on this treadmill effectively. And so what, what metabolic flexibility in a fasting lifestyle does for you is it prevents that cycle right. and it can break it. If you're in that cycle and you do the transition, as I suggest, you can actually break out of it. Yeah. So, and then maybe just quickly, like you, you write about both diabetes and cancer. Right? Mm-hmm. So diabetes, of course, is a big problem with obesity, but also there's increasing evidence that cancer cells are fed by sugar. Could you go That's through right. the effects on diabetes and, and cancer and how this connects? Well, in type 2 diabetes is a fairly simple one because type 2 diabetes is, is essentially a, a result of this, this type of insulin resistance. Um, so it's, it's a metabolic disorder. Jason Fung, whom you quoted earlier, actually writes the foreword to the book. Jason Fung is treating people with type 2 diabetes in his clinic in Toronto with fasting. He's getting people off of supplemental insulin and helping them reverse type 2 diabetes precisely through this process. Because what essentially what doctor physicians have been doing is they give you insulin in order to increase the amount of insulin that, that, that keeps your blood sugar level. They, so you give you that because, okay, your blood sugar is getting too high. I need to give you more insulin. Well, it, now based on that story I've just told you, every, every listener should realize What's that going to do? Well, it's just perpetuating the process. So you kind of you have to keep increasing the amount of insulin. So this is why people that take insulin get fatter and fatter and fatter. You got to break out of that. And what Fung has discovered is that actually he'll he'll put people in, under a clinically supervised environment on a seven day water fast, and guess what? They go into ketosis. And this process reverses. But this isn't something that until recently anyone really entertained. This was considered a kind of heretical idea. Now, this question of, of cancer is interesting. Can I say one thing of, just super fast no. before you do cancer? So, um, do you know the philosopher Russell Hittinger? Yes, of yeah. course I know okay. Russ. Yeah. yeah. 
So he did this. Yes. Through Weston Price. That's right. He just changed his diet. And uh, it was, yeah. I remember talking to him about it. And he explained it. It was just like, I saw him. He was like, I think he lost like 50 pounds. Yeah, he was a big, he was a heavy guy. And now he's a thin guy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it was just Weston Price, cream, bath. Yeah. Like, you know, this was, yeah. I think mean, the last time I saw him was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, the last time I saw him. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's amazing. But it's, it's interesting. Like Russ was doing this early, right? But there were a couple, like Weston Price in the 50s, like there were some people who knew this. But yeah, now with Jason- yeah, with Jason Fung and a lot of other people, it's really, it's quite remarkable how this happens. And one thing I think that's just striking, I want to say before, forget, before we move to the cancer question is, you say in your book that your body can basically hold a teaspoon, your blood can basically hold about a mm-hmm. teaspoon of sugar at a time. After that, it becomes toxic. So there are what, eight teaspoons in a Coca-Cola? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And so the first thing you got to get that out of your blood, your body's like, get this out of the blood. And it's going to go somewhere. And if your liver's already saturated, your muscles are saturated, you know, with glucose, it's going to have to store it as, as fat. Okay, so now that I think is a good segue to the cancer question because yes, it's getting sent all throughout. And that you talk about the different like cells die, but cancer yeah. cells don't want to die. Can you go over that? Yeah, absolutely. And so this is there's a, there's a key thing that I have not mentioned here, and it's that when you're in ketosis, that is, or when, you, when you're fasting, your cells basically have two modes. They can be either in the go go mode where they're getting fuel, right? And so okay, now we're gonna we, that means we need to work and exercise, and so they're it's, think of them as being on. But there's also a repair and recycle mode in which what your body your cells do this thing called autophagy, which means self eating. So basically, we have a broken organelle, and the cell will absorb that and recycle it and repair itself. But your body doesn't do the repair and recycle mode when it's in the go-go mode. Well, guess what signal you need to give your body to tell it to get into recycle mode or go mode? Food. Food coming in is the signal. And so you can figure this out. If you want your cells to go into that recycle mode, there need to be times when they're not being fed. And when they do that, this is why when, you, when you're fasting, if you're doing this properly and you're in ketosis, you're putting your cells into this state, you know, you're encouraging this process of autophagy in which they're recycling themselves. And so there's actually these weird health benefits over a certain kind of length of, of fasting, the most dramatic of which is certain kinds of cancer. And this is actually a, a professor at, at Boston College that developed this theory of cancer as a metabolic disease. And and the kind of key insight is that cancer cells, unlike normal cells, most of the cells of your body do really well. They can use either fat or sugar for fuel. So the mitochondria in those cells can use either of those. But there's this weird feature of many types of cancer in which they can only use sugar. They can't use fat for fuel, um, which sets up this interesting hypothesis that of which we've already got some experimental data that at least for some kinds of cancer, an actual way of treating that cancer is by putting your body into ketosis. So that, in other words, you give the body a type of fuel that it can use, fats, and deprive it of a fuel that only cancer cells can use, which is the sugar, mm. right? And so that's, that's the basic idea. I'm simplifying things slightly, but that's the basic idea so that you're starving the cancer cells. And so this is why there's a clinic in, in California that's doing this as a protocol is adding a fasting regimen prior to chemotherapy. There are also another, a couple of other reasons why fasting seems to actually help yeah. patients deal with the side effects of chemotherapy. And so this is, to me, it's in some ways, it's, we're right at the edge of our knowledge on this, mm-hmm. but I, I, I basically try to summarize what the state of knowledge on this is, that actually fasting can actually perhaps, at least in some cases, help fight certain kinds of cancer. Right. Okay. That's good. Yeah. And obviously you're not saying like, you know, fasting is going to solve all cancer, but it's more complex, but I think it's, 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 it is interesting. And I think goes back to this point that what's interesting about this is it's not simply a new technical solution of which we'd love cancer therapies. They're sure. great. Let's have more yes. cancer therapies. Let's like, you know, but it's also an old traditional way of eating that's more aligned with how we are made. Absolutely. With how we're made. And that's, that's the key thing. Because remember, this is all, it's the, the natural pattern for food for the animal kingdom, right? Not just for humans, is that food is not constantly abundant in the same amounts and at the same amount of time in the same types. There's a kind of seasonality to this in most cases. There's a seasonality of our days. We have diurnal days, right, where we have a morning and night. Right. Just as the days of God's creation have a morning and night, there are days we work in the day, we rest at night. 
God even rests on day seven. And so I would argue that there's a type of that kind of fast feast or fasting and eating pattern that you do at the, at the day scale and that you do at the weekly scale and that you do at the seasonal scale. And all of those have spiritual and physical benefits. Yeah. So I want to go to those because we're, I know you've, you have to get a flight here soon. So mm-hmm. I want to go back to nature in a second, but just one last thing on the physical side. And that is, I think something that, especially for you, but I think for, I mean, for me too, I mean, and for so many, we're trying to keep muscle, right? As we get older, you got to keep muscle. Right. And there's this thing, you know, that you've got to eat constantly, like you talked about earlier, and yes. you have to have protein shakes and, and this idea you're going to lose muscle. And I actually remember, yeah. I, this is funny. I remember this. Um, I was, I think it was, I was like a, on a fast or whatever. And you said uh-huh. something to me like, you can't do that. You're going to lose muscle. And your wife's <laughs> like, leave him alone. There's more to fast <laughs> life than muscle. I mean, they, that funny. but, but I, but I get that. I mean, like it's because yeah. I, I had the same thing. Like, no, I got to make sure I eat right here. I got to, you know, and as you get older and older, about I think it's after about 30, you start losing muscle mass. So you're, it's hard right. to keep muscle. So, but, but this, I think, was a... Oh, and one other thing that I want to just... That's so great, I want to affirm before we get to muscle is you tell a story of, of your wife, Ginny, in the book who recognized why fasting was so hard is because yeah. of the sugar need. And once right. she did it, she was like off. And so the other day, we were somewhere and my wife and I are doing this project. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, I walked back. I said, you know, I just thought of something. She looked at me. I said, well, I said, you know, we've been married for 20 years. I've known you for 22 years. And in 22 years, I mean, you didn't say you were starving today because we hadn't eaten all day. We were, we were somewhere. We were, we were somewhere. We hadn't eaten all day. And I said, this thing is working. And she started laughing. She goes, oh my goodness, it's true. And when I read the part about Ginny, I laughed. I mean, it was really funny because this idea, like I'm starving, I got to eat. You go into this you go into this diet and all of a sudden fasting is possible. Fasting totally, is not, yeah. it's just possible. So, okay, so let's go, I, before I go into that, unless you want to comment, I want to ask But I want to I want to talk about this muscle thing because this yeah, is a stumbling let's talk block about muscle for me. It's so encouraging yes, too. And it really is because I thought, okay, well, maybe that's just something you have to sacrifice. But I thought, well, this is strange. And so we're supposed to do this spiritual discipline that's going to cause us to lose lean muscle mass and put on fat, right? Which is because that was the story is that you don't want your body to go into starvation mode, shed all the calorie consuming muscle and store fat, right? Oh, I mean, just so you know, like I've teased you a little bit, like, you know, about fat, but on this, I'm exactly like you, exactly like, no, I better do this, but like, you know, how am I going to keep that little muscle that I have? I know. And and, and I got to make sure I eat this and like, oh my goodness. And, (laughs) and so, yeah, I mean, I don't just in case, I mean, like, you know, I'm giving you a little bit of a hard time, but no, I mean, I was earlier th- than you thinking that fat doesn't make you fat, which just gave me the benefit of enjoying butter faster. Right. But on the uh, all these other things, I mean, you're, it's just, this, was oh, a, it's just, this was the dominant thing, everything you read. It was. And you, uh, years of fitness magazines and yeah. books on this. And so, well, it takes And your so book is so good on this. And that's why I, I really want and you to so, talk yeah. about this. This Super is helpful because it's a, definitely a big deal to me. Um, but th- th- this is kind of, tr- the, the starvation mode is true if you're constantly restricting calories. If you're mm-hmm. constantly restricting calories, you will de- slowly, your body after a few weeks, right? If you're eating a certain amount, it downshifts its metabolism to account for what's coming in. And so one of the things it might do is actually, it'll get rid of some fat, but it will also get rid of some muscle because it just assumes, okay, well, here's the new baseline. Well, it turns out fasting, their body's response to fasting is entirely different. And so what happens when you fast, now I, what I'm describing is what will happen to you once you get used to fasting. There's some mm-hmm. bumps and bruises along the way when you're first adjusting to it. But let's say you're normally in a fasting lifestyle and you say, okay, well, I'm not going to eat now for, for 36 hours. And you're not going to have basically any calories for 36 hours. And your body kicks into ketosis. Well, you know what it does? It kicks up norepinephrine. So it increases your energy and it kicks up growth hormone. It kicks up the production of human growth hormone, which preserves lean muscle mass. And it continues to do this for three days. And so it it takes five days of water only fasting in order for your metabolism to get back to where it was at the very beginning. So in other words, it speeds up your metabolism and it produces the hormone that preserves your lean muscle mass, which really makes perfect sense. It would be a very bad design if God had made us so that the second, you know, the hunter gatherer misses a meal, 
his body starts shuts down and starts getting rid of muscle, right? That makes no sense. Right. Now, the reality is the way the body is designed is no, actually you get more energy. It preserves lean muscle mass because you need to go out and hunt food. It's only when your body finally decides, well, they must really be starving that then it starts slowing down the metabolism. And so fasting does your, it does an entirely different thing to your metabolism than uh, kind of just constant calorie restriction. So you don't have this dilemma where either I'm going to fast or I'm going to retain lean muscle mass. No, in fact, this is the, this is a way to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, and, and by the way, like when I told you the story, when I was asking you, I can lose muscle mass. I don't want you or anybody else to think that I wasn't worried. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> right? So I mean, I like, yeah, I don't, I mean, like, yeah, I don't, I'm not. So, and you say this, this you say this here on page uh, 57, you talk about not hoarding fat. You explain it, that it makes sense, Right for you to do this and why you explain it. So it's definitely worth reading how it works. And then you, you quote uh, Jason Fung again, yeah. and I'll give a short version. He says, let's imagine we're living in Paleolithic times during the summer of plenty. We eat lots of food, store some as fat in our body. Now it's winter. There's nothing to eat. What do you think our body does? Does it start burning our precious muscle? Doesn't and preserving our fat? Doesn't that sound pretty idiotic, right? He says, <laughs> as if, if you were at a, you stored firewood for a wood burning stove and you had all your firewood away. And then, right, what happens? You chop up the sofa and you throw that into the oven, right? It just doesn't make any sense, right? And you and you explain that. And so this leads to this question that I want to address about how we can think about it, especially if one is a Christian, one does not accept materialism, and, and how to think about that. So one of the ways you think about it is like, you know, there's the paleo diet. And so mm -hmm. part of it is, you know, paleolithic times, okay. The part of it's a little bit like, you know, agriculture is bad. You know, you, you quote, yeah. um, what's his name? Jared Diamond, you know, Jared Guns, Drugs, and Steel fame. He's like, you know, worst thing that ever happened was yeah, agriculture. Yeah, like agriculture, yeah. the worst thing that ever happened, <laughs> um, of course. And it's a problem. There's this kind of materialism. And then there was, there's not just adaptation, but kind of Richard Dawkins esque Darwinist positions there. Yeah. And so it pushes people away. They're like, oh, give me a break. I mean, this is so bad. But there is adaptation. There's something to, and I think the value, of course, you're talking about, these are ancient Christian practices That's long right. beforehand. But could you address, like, how do we think about, how do you engage the kind of always hyper-materialist, hyper-Darwinist yeah. problem that is going to push a lot of people away from thinking about these things? Well, it does, especially if they kind of dip into the paleo literature. You know, there's a lot of the kind of Darwinian storytelling in which natural selection and random genetic mutations have this amazing creative power to do absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so the temptation is either, you know, either to totally buy into that or to reject it entirely. And so my view is that, well, well, first of all, let's look at the evidence we have of natural selection and what it can and can't do. Natural selection is good at pruning. It's good at preserving things that already are there. It's not good at creating. And so somebody once said, I think it was Ernst Mayer or someone that, you know, it's good at explaining the survival of the fittest, but not the arrival of the fittest. And so I think where you get into these kind of Darwinian fallacies is when you assume that mere natural selection and random genetic mutation is sufficient to pr produce entire organs and in entire complex systems. There's not only is there no evidence of that, there's mm -hmm. plenty of reason to think that's just not true. And then in mm -hmm. fact, you need purpose and intelligence in order to produce these kinds of things. At the same time, natural selection is a filter. And so I think you can use natural selection. It, it kind of a, basically it's a, a mental exercise to say, okay, look, if something was truly toxic to human beings and human welfare, it would not have probably been a central part of a cuisine for thousands of years, right? right. Uh, because people would have gotten weeded out of the gene pool. So see, you're thinking natural selection is a real force, but it doesn't create new things. And so that's, I think, the, the way you can use a lot of the kind of insights from the paleo literature, but they completely overdo this. And one way in which they do this is essentially to say that everything that we've done since yeah, since the fall into agriculture has been a disaster. Because right. first of all, we don't have that much knowledge or information right. about what people were doing. I mean, so much of this stuff is just kind of story, Darwinian storytelling. Oh, yeah, just those um, stories. They're all over. That's, why, those that's stories. why I like ice cream. I like ice no, cream. No, absolutely. Like, you know, it's there's so, it's yeah, been this whale who liked it. ice cream, who's right handed. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, this is why like, whenever, whenever you hear a story, a Darwinian story that explains, you know, why men prefer women with a particular body type or something like that. Oh, yeah. You'll hear some kind of story and it sounds plausible. You think, now, could you tell a similar Darwinian story for the opposite? 
for why men would like a different kind of body type. You can almost always come up with some kind of Darwinian justification, you know, um, and that's, you that's know, the charm of the theories explains everything and it's opposite. And this is, I think, sign of it being misused. It doesn't mean yeah. natural Do you selection know, VS, is not a real thing. Sorry. Pardon? Yeah, it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't mean natural selection is not a real thing. Sorry. I interrupted. Do you know a neuroscientist VS Ramachandran? Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Anyway, he has some yeah. really interesting books on like, Right. Lynch. But they has, yep. he actually has a section uh, where he <laughs> he starts talking about this very thing. And then he says, oh yeah, the best part about it is I can just make up whatever I want. And so <laughs> I actually, I wrote a note like, is this writing under persecution? Meaning you can't say not. So he kind of makes a joke at it or does he actually like, what is it? But it, it's really interesting. Yeah, when, when, there's, when there's a story that when you can make up a story for absolutely everything, you know, it's just, it's it ends up being it okay, theory. but back to this question. So I, I sorry. So the natural, so so that, but natural selection is you said a real force. It's a real thing, but we need to think of it as a filter and not a creator. Think of it as mm -hmm. a pruner and not a gardener, not a planter. But here's the other thing: is would you say this is correct? Did I interpret you correctly? That a lot of the paleo literature that's dealing with some of these things mm -hmm. is is quite good paleo keto yes, literature. That's right. But they're just kind of adding on the, the Darwinian a thing lot the of this story. stuff that you yeah. don't really need this. Yeah. But because the basic insight is one we've already talked about is that if something's been in the human diet for a long time, it's probably benign. And if something's brand new and created and not really even natural, then needless, we know for sure that we aren't adapted to it. Now it might be yeah. benign, but we know it hasn't stood the test of time of thousands of years of, of, basically being filtered by natural selection. That's, and that's the key insight. And you can almost, you can accept that without accepting all the kind of far-fetched, you know, sort of Darwinian just so stories that are often in the paleo literature. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, I always notice the other one is that whenever I hear about how somebody, somebody or something or some animal made an evolutionary decision, I always <laughs> start to think, wait, wait a minute. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong on that, but that always makes me suspect. Is that is my uh, you know, this correct? Is problem, it's very often Darwinism, the kind of Darwinian explanation, it just uses a designer substitute. So you could almost say, well, you know, God did this because it, first of all, natural selection doesn't select things. It doesn't choose things. And so when people are speaking that way, what they're really doing is they're revealing the fact that it's just basically impossible to talk about biology without using purposive language. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you get to the point where I think, and actually you quote, I think you quote it where Stephen Hawking says, you know, the universe will create itself from nothing. Like, yeah. wait, what happened to science? <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's, so, but I think that's, I think it's worth just, but that's a whole other topic. And actually we have a yeah. conversation on materialism in another episode, but I meant the point is to say that, cause I, there's like people I write on, on I read on the paleo things who, who I like, you know, and, and then they, I think they end up kind of using a just so story, just like I think Friedrich Hayek does this. I mean, I think sure, Hayek yeah. has some really good insights into the knowledge problem. And then all of a sudden it's like, where'd that come from? And I, I know. and I don't think those are the necessary. Okay. So, so let's then move to the end here. And you have a chapter called Fasting to Clear Your Mind. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that I think this is actually a better segue of, of clarity because I want to talk about fasting to clear your mind. And then I want to talk about like this idea of the, you know, I don't know if you quote this or not, but just hit me right now. Like be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Mm -hmm. And if we want clear minds, both for work and study and thinking and for uh, healthy relationships, and then I want to move into really like fasting and feasting and then we'll end. So could you talk a little bit about clarity? Because that's another, like, just like I was so excited to learn about the muscle element and, and that you're, yeah. you're actually human growth hormone and all that. The clarity of mind is a, is, a, is a real benefit. Can you talk about that? No, it really is. And, I, and honestly, I would, you know, if I were a secularist and I discovered this, I would probably fast just for this. And so basically what this is, is that your brain needs a certain amount of glucose, but it's it absolutely needs some. And so your body will actually convert protein into glucose if it has to. But your body, your brain can also use ketones. It can use this as a type of the separate type of fuel that your body takes fat and it converts them to ketones and a particular ketone in particular that your brain really, really likes is a, you think of as a really clean burning fuel. And it gives you a kind of mental clarity that you don't actually experience. Otherwise I, I have a type of mental clarity and lucidity that I have when I am in ketosis, 
and so and when I'm fasting that I don't have otherwise. And this is something that, you know, it's widely remarked on. It's known, in fact, this is for a long time in, in, in uh, certain types of uh, seizure disorders mm-hmm. um, and epilepsy are treated with ketogenic diet. It, that seems to do something different with your brain. Again, which sort of can make sense, you know, if you if you're in a mode where you don't have a lot of food and you're in a hunter gatherer situation, right, and your body's drawing on body fat reserves, you'd want to be mentally clear, and that's exactly what you experience. And this is the this is the result of this kind of ketosis. And I've gone back now, and you read some uh, spiritual theologians talking about fasting; they actually experience this. You mm-hmm. might assume, well, it's just kind of a spiritual thing. It's like, there's actually a really basic kind of physiological process in which your brain is using ketones and it's in ketosis. And so this is what, really the, one of the first things you'll experience uh, when you enter in ketosis, as long as you do it correctly so that you're not freaking out because you're shifting into a new uh, metabolism. And so, I mean, like right now, I'm, you know, I've been, it's been a good long while since I've had any calories. I can, I can tell mentally I'm, I'm clearer than I would be otherwise. And I know when I, when the book first came out, I did all the long interviews in a fasted state precisely so I would be mentally clear. And, you know, we all sort of experience bad brain days and good brain days, but it's it's funny that uh, actually ketosis is one way that you can sort of give yourself a mental edge. It's good. Well, we need all the help we can get, so. <laughs> That's for sure. So let's talk then and finish here with feasting and prayer. Yes. So it's Lent right now. 2021. Yep. And the three eminently good works are prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Mm-hmm. And you don't write much about almsgiving, but I think that one of the tradition is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that part of what you're in giving up certain things in the fast, it gives you extra money to help, Yeah, which is part of the almsgiving and it's part of like denying yourself. Let's talk about the prayer element and one, how fasting relates to prayer But also, why is the ancient tradition, Jewish and Christian traditions, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, the three eminently good works, they go together during times of Lent. Let's talk a little bit about that because it's also the wonderful Christian contribution. I mean, you you say at one point, Christians should be on the vanguard of this. You know, I I was listening to some two secularists in a podcast, and it was really interesting, I learned, but they talked about they do meditation, you know? And Jay, I thought to myself, you know what? Like, my mental prayer, is not serious enough, mm-hmm. right? And these, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, you know, provocative to secularists, not so to Christians. Or, but these secularists are doing meditation, which actually, it's an interesting study to show that maybe it makes you more selfish. But they're just right. meditating, like their body or. Phys- I mean, mental prayer is communication with the living God who loves yeah. you, and you're in divine filiation. You're his, you're his son. You're his daughter. You're in relationship with him. And it's how wisdom comes. There's wonderful, but actually I'll put a couple of books. Like there's a little book by um, yeah. Father Philippe called Nine Days to Prayer. Um, yes. Right now I'm reading Bonaventures for Lent. Bonaventures, the Mice Journey to God. Just unbelievable, mm. right? And um, as you said, the Dominican tradition and the Benedictine tradition and the Carmelites, you know, there's so much beautiful, the many beautiful things here. But you have all these seculars who are meditating and fasting. And then Christians, we're not fasting enough and we're not engaged in mental prayer. We've lost a right. sense of that. And we've also, I think, especially um, from the influence of Protestantism and from Jansenism in the Catholic Church, have this idea, oh, we don't want to be Pelagian, like, or, or like, like kind of a reaction against that. We don't want to be Pelagian. We don't want to, like, works or all these kind of things are going on. There's, so maybe why don't you walk us through a little bit about yeah. how fasting connects to prayer and why fasting is so such a benefit for that. And maybe... Again, I've asked you a lot there, but you're, no, you know what like I'm talking about. Questions. Why don't you go for it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, that's the, fun having you weird... on. Here, Jay, blah, let me tell you 15 <laughs> things. Talk. <laughs> I mean, it's weird. I, I think there's a weird spiritual mystery of why fasting uh, benefits prayer because there is something about it. It's as long standing in our tradition is that, you know, you want these things to go together. I really do think there's some mysterious physical power in which we increase the the effectiveness of the power of our prayer when we fast. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I do know that it kind of on the natural level, if you're fasting, you're constantly being reminded um, when you're hungry, it's a constant little bodily reminder of a spiritual discipline. And for most of us, the problem with prayer is that, as you said, you're communing with the living God, you're, you, you know, you 
experience divine illumination, and you can't keep your mind on it for more than 15 seconds without the mind drifting, right? Those five, bo- five both darn seconds. things, yeah, and off you go. And, um, well, fasting, you've got a constant little physical reminder that it's happening. Uh, now, at the same time, I do absolutely think that um, certain formal prayers are crucial to our spiritual arsenal. Absolutely. So I don't think, I think for most of us, hours of spontaneous prayer A meditative prayer is just, I mean, I think it's something you build up to. Uh, I don't have that capacity. Um, I absolutely depend upon the liturgy of the hours on reading the morning and evening prayers. God has given us a book of prayers in the Psalms that the church has been using for hundreds and hundreds of years. Use that. Use the rosary if you're Catholic, which I'm convinced. Notice in the rosary, you're meditating on Christ you're revering his mother and you're basically asking his mother to bring me, she as a disciple of Christ, bring me to Jesus. Uh, so you're sort of looking at Jesus through the eyes of Mary. You're so you meditating. Can do whatever on, he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. You're meditating on particular episodes. So you're picturing something mentally that's an image, right? And then you're doing this highly rote um, thing with beads, which is a physical thing that's really hard to do if you don't have the rosary in your hand, right? So you're combining all these things together. I absolutely believe for most people, we need those spiritual disciplines just as you need. If you want to be strong, you need to do push-ups. If you want to be a great prayer warrior, you need these basic prayer tools that the church gives us. So don't be thinking, oh, well, you know, it's just some kind of rote thing. I really need to be spontaneous. Most of us don't have that capacity. And if you say that, you just won't ever really pray. Right. Do these things just as fasting, fast on a schedule. Use the church schedule to remind you if it's you're going to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, which is what happens in the tradition. It's external to you, right? So you don't have to just depend on every day right. your own willpower because it's given to you. And so I think these are all tools to increase us in our our, our, our spiritual disciplines and our holiness. Yeah, that's great. And I think you know, Teresa of Avila, the Carmelite, you know, the great mm. mystic, she said most of the time she needed a book. As you said, concentration is really hard. And and yeah, it's uh, me too. It's the hours, praying, like doing the readings and um, all those things that you, you said, I think are, are, are really Im- important. The other thing is, I, I'm not, we won't talk about this, but I will say this, that, you know, you were a strength trainer in college. Mm-hmm. I actually learned a lot about, I mean, you were my strength trainer, <laughs> constantly <laughs> telling me, fixing things up and how to do things. Uh, so, and you talk about actually the importance of lifting weights of, of high yep. intensity training in the book. So it's worth, the, this book is great. You just, if you don't have read the book, go get the book. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's interesting. I think this. So let's maybe one more question on on the prayer part that you could articulate is which you touched on a little bit. Just like fasting is not supposed to be agony, mm-hmm. and even though prayer and fasting are, are difficult, it's a spiritual discipline. But theologically, right, it's not Pelagianism, right? It's not oh. you're not you're not being saved by your works. Just oh, no. like obeying the commandments, like Psalm 119 says the, your, the commandments are mercy, they're a gift, that obeying the commandments, you're doing that through grace, right? It's like, it's not a work where you buy you merit. Could you maybe just start to, you, you talk about that in your book, which is, I think, important because, and the other thing that's, maybe you could talk about that and that it's not denunciation of the body or of pleasure, and we'll get to that with feasting. It's an affirmation that we're embodied persons living in a world that is beautiful and using St. Bonaventure, that's vestige image and likeness, that the world is a gift that we have stewardship over. Can you talk about that? Because I think it's very different from, the, from either Jansenism or certain types of Calvinism and Puritanism, and it's different from transhumanism hedonism. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's the point about fasting and feasting. And most of the time when you eat, we eat because we need it. And food is a good thing because God's made us to be bodily. And so we need food to keep going. But it's a good, but it's not the ultimate good. And so it also needs to be restrained and ordered. That's what fasting allows us to do. But at the same time, God wants us to celebrate the goodness of life and especially the goodness of the things that he's done. And that's what the feasting is, is that it is a celebration of those things. And so it reminds us that um, I, I do. I think that these things are all, these are graces. These aren't things we do in order to save ourselves. These are things that God gives us in order to help us bring us closer to him and to, to each other in the way that we ought to. And so it's a, it's a way of ordering that really is a, it's on the analogy with exactly what God does in the creation, his own creation week in which he, remember, he works during the day. 
He rests. It's always evening and morning, the first and the second, and the third day. So he rests at night and then he rests on the seventh day. And then we are imitating that. So we're imitating God when he does that. But he's also giving us the capacity to do that because I, I know for myself is that developing a fasting lifestyle, which involves all these things, puts you in a different place spiritually. But it puts you in a different place spiritually because God gives you things. This is something that he's given us. This is not something that we're doing to save ourselves. It's something that I'm absolutely convinced is, is a gift that we've essentially been depriving ourselves of as Christians for the better part of a century. Yeah. I also, by the way, just I also find doing it, starting this diet, I mean, you can start it anytime you want. Then the book yeah. is great. And it has this like six weeks, it has a whole guide exactly how to do it. First week, second week, you know, it's really good. It tells you what to shop and everything. I mean, it's, it's really helpful. I mean, you probably need some extra recipe books, but it's just a really good book to get you going. But I also think starting it in Lent is the best time to do it. So if you haven't started a yeah. fast, start now. Right, because Absolutely. because of that extra grace that you get in Lent, right? That's what yes. that's what it's for. So, one of the things I love, I just is how you said you critique the idea of a cheat day. It's so good. Mm -hmm. I love it. it. It's it's you said you know everybody says okay you got your diet and now, now you're on a cheat day and you say no it's completely the wrong way to think about it. It's a feast. No, you it's feast, a feast with the church. You celebrate the the saint or the solemnity or the uh, the the holy days of the Paschal mysteries and Easter which are coming yeah. up, and that you an octave, right? And you you celebrate, right. you're not cheating you're not against cheating your diet. What, doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah, that's the problem. This idea of cheating is that, well, you really, well, first of all, who are you cheating? You're not cheating anyone, but it's it, it treats it as if it's sort of a necessary evil. And in fact, it's a crucial part of the whole is that kind of celebration. And, and frankly, it also makes life much better if you're not constantly depriving yourself of these things that you love. Maybe you love carrot cake. Maybe you love Oreos. I don't know. But it's not like those are intrinsically bad things. It's just that they need to be ordered properly. And if it's as long as it's in a, this occasional opportunity for celebration and feasting, that's a good thing. We shouldn't think of it as, well, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating on my diet. That's not what's happening. Yeah, that's great. I think it's just another really great addition. And so, you know, as, as we end here, I like, in a sense, as we were talking, I think about, you know, you mentioned transhumanism. I think about so much of the so many of the self-help books and everything in many ways this is a self-help book and more mm -hmm. because it's really about living a flourishing diet i mean sorry a flourishing life not just about yeah. a diet sorry uh and a flourishing diet okay the flourishing life uh but <laughs> but i think what you know you mentioned in the book a couple times we've lost this tradition of fasting and mm -hmm. you know we've had crises in the church especially you know in the last decades with lots oh, of moral yeah. evil and people are bringing back fasting. They're bringing back the ember days, which are, are certain, mm -hmm. uh, I'll put a link up to that. But um, those are practices in the old rite of different days during the year, four times a year in the seasons, where, where there's fast days on, on Wednesday, Thursday. I'm sorry, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. And you talk about the ember days, you talk about the fasting. But it's, I think you, you mentioned that we actually, I would tell me if I'm adding this, maybe you write about this, I didn't read it, but we're constantly looking for some way to live better life, to be more focused, to be more productive, to be, you know, to be in better shape. And what's what's interesting is that, and also then we need to be morally in, better, and we need to to grow in our moral lives and human flourishing in our families. But we're so we're so confused about embodiment. We're so confused about basic philosophical understandings of the goodness of being and the intelligibility of the universe, and that that joy is not simply something you grasp, but is the fruit of a love relationship. And, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm adding too much to your book, but I think your book plays a real important role by regaining the discipline of fasting and prayer and feasting. Yes. We un begin, it's, a, it's embodied practice to understand embodiment, improve our moral Absolutely. life, to learn how to serve others, to participate in self-denial for the good of ourselves and the others in the world. And it's, it's really, in a sense, one, that's not the only one, but it's, it's this, this idea of getting fasting right is, I think, a really important thing for our time. Am I, I, maybe I'm, I'm, no, maybe I'm pushing your book too far, but go for it. No, what think? that's absolutely what, I, that, that's why I wrote it. It's, I think that's exactly right. I think that we live disordered lives and it's, it's a, in part of this a disorder between our bodies and our souls, between our spiritual lives and our, our worldly lives. And, I think there's a reason that even secularists are sort of reaching, they're groping. And I think that's that this fasting, you know, the, the fasting craze actually is an opportunity for us to 
affirm it partly, but also I think to locate it within a properly Christian framework, which is what I try to do. Yeah, great. So let's just conclude that your last is, you know, the, the primordial feast, fast of the wedding and the feast of the lamb. And you talk about like fractal geometry and the, this is very Bonaventurian. So like, even though I'm a, a big Dominic fan. Uh, so <laughs> why don't you maybe end with this, like, kind of on that, on that theme that it's a vision. It's not simply a diet. It's not simply about being healthy, but it's, a, it's this vision of the world and that takes into account so much of what we learned in modern science. And, and so to kind of summarize the thing on the back of your book, maybe you could just summarize this, that modern science and the ancient Christian tradition support fasting for healthy living, but beyond healthy living for actually leading a good life. No, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what this is about because I mean, ultimately, um, I mean, our ultimate destiny is beyond this world, but the, the world is, uh, as Paul says, the whole creation is groaning in travail until the Son of Man comes, is that we believe not just in the life everlasting, but in uh, the resurrection of the body. And so I'm, I'm convinced that these sort of basic physical processes and these things that we do with our lives and with our eating and with our celebration and our, our meals actually have eternal and spiritual significance. And so there should be a way to integrate these things so that it should ultimately, we should not be surprised that the best science will discover that these ancient spiritual practices of fasting would also be good for us physically. Yeah, it just really reflects the beauty of this fact that we are embodied persons. We are ensouled organisms mm -hmm. and that our bodies aren't bad that we need to escape from. And we're not simply bodies, but we're these beautiful creatures create an image of God who are uh, yeah. images and likeness. And, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. So Jay, thanks for taking all the time. I took, I know you got a flight tonight. I really appreciate yep. talking to you and I hope to have you back and we can talk about lots of other things. Thanks. Thanks, Michael.